I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about some of our uh, experiences with uh, using uh, UAVs in vineyards uh, in order to uh, see if we can uh, uh, use them in, in terms of uh, precision agriculture applications. Um, I think most of you are quite familiar at least with, uh, with UAVs, at least on a, uh, how, how shall we say, just a, a very basic scale. Uh, you're, you're seeing them now in uh, big wedding parties and uh, graduations and things like that. And, and uh, finally, we're, we're starting to see them used in, in agriculture, uh, first of all in uh, uh, pest management uh, to, to be able to detect certain diseases and things like that, possibly even virus diseases, and, and also for uh, other aspects of precision agriculture. Now, as you uh, well know, uh, if you're collecting uh, these spectral data, they need to be converted into something that is going to be usable and uh, the spectral data is normally uh, converted into uh, one or more uh, vegetation indices uh, such as NDVI, uh, NDVI red, green, uh, red edge, uh, inflection point, things of that nature, uh, which is what we're doing in this project. And then of course the, the data has got to be validated. Uh, one of the things that Andrew mentioned is of course uh, not only do you have the, the green that's being um, uh, uh, part of the, the vineyard row, but you've also possibly got uh, uh, green cover crops in there and things like that. And so you, go, you have to do something to po uh, possibly mask out that uh, cover crop so that you're looking at exclusively uh, the, the canopy that you're dealing with. Um, we've got several types of uh, remote sensing um, aircraft, of course, that are flying somewhere uh, between, shall we say, 500 to, uh, to 1,000 meters. Uh, some of the uh, aircraft that we were using a few years back were around 900 meters. Satellites, of course, that are 10,000 meters or more, and then uh, drones and uh, the, the drones that we're using are somewhere around 80 to 90 meters. And so, so with that, of course, there's going to be different levels of uh, resolution. And in the case of uh, UAVs, we're looking at very, very high resolution and a lot of data and a lot of information that, uh, that one needs to uh, find their way through. Um, the other thing I wanted to just mention in passing, and uh, we have a poster downstairs, unfortunately it's not landscape, it's, uh, it's this way because I, I uh, made the poster before uh, Greg sent out the, uh, the instructions, so, uh, so I'm bad. Um, but anyways, we're also using this Green Seeker technology, which is uh, proximal sensing, we're going through the vineyard and collecting spectral reflectance from the sides of the canopy. Of course, because you're collecting these data from the sides of the canopy, uh, you're generally going to be getting um, higher NDVI readings. So we're, we're very often getting NDVI readings up in the uh, uh, 9.9 uh, to, uh, or even slightly higher because you're basically collecting this uh, very dark green uh, canopy that you're looking at. Um, uh, uh, Andrew's already talked a little bit about this, so I think I can skip through this fairly quickly. Uh, you all are familiar, I think, with uh, the basic electromagnetic spectrum. We're collecting data. Uh, now I just need to find, there it is. Uh, we're generally uh, collecting data in here, looking at uh, mostly the uh, uh, reflectance in, in the, the red range and also in the, the near infrared range and from this uh, calculating our NDVI. So for instance, if you've got a healthy canopy, it's going to have lots of chlorophyll. Chlorophyll uh, absorbs primarily in the, uh, the red and the blue, reflects in, in the green, and so you should have uh, a relatively high uh, uh, reflectance in the green and relatively low in the red. If you've got a, a leaf that's going to, that, that for instance is low in nitrogen or, or low in uh, 
uh, a combination of other nutrients or is sick or is stressed, maybe water stressed. Uh, there's going to be a lot more reflectance in, in the red and um, and in the, uh, the NIR, and so we can calculate this normalized difference vegetation index based on our uh, reflectance of, of red and uh, near infrared. So as an example, here we are, here, here we've got a, a healthy, uh, in this case, tree. Uh, it's gonna be uh, uh, taking in a lot of red this one is going to be reflecting a lot of red, and so our uh, NDVI in this case is say in the sevens, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, and here is going to be quite low. Okay, let's move on and talk about uh, uh, what we're doing here, and the objectives basically were just to try to s uh, assess the usefulness of uh, using UAVs in, in vineyards in Ontario. Ontario. Um, Riesling and, and Cabernet Franc and to see if we could uh, in fact determine some unique zones uh, based on these uh, UAV flyovers and then see if we could associate um, the NDVI with stuff on the ground. Um, common things like yield and yield components, uh, berry composition, uh, but also winter hardiness in the form of uh, LT50 and uh, uh, things such as uh, uh, stomatal conductance, leaf water potential, soil moisture, et cetera. Um, talk a little bit about uh, where we're doing this work. This is uh, just a, a sketch of the Niagara Peninsula. Uh, we have, in fact, uh, 12 vineyard blocks, six different sites. Uh, here we have Lake Ontario, so Toronto would be up here. Uh, Lake Erie down here, so Buffalo would be about here, and Cleveland down there, and Portland way over there. Um, entirely sedimentary, the uh, parent material above the escarpment, which is this uh, dotted green line, is all dolostone. Um, below the escarpment is primarily uh, sandstone and shale. It's also heavily glaciated, and so uh, the, uh, this is old Lake Iroquois down here. So most of the uh, soils uh, in, in this part of the uh, peninsula are all going to be uh, mostly uh, sand and sandy loams uh, from the, the old lake shore. Further back, we're looking at pre predominantly uh, glacial till over lacustrine. And as we get even further back, almost exclusively lacustrine. So uh, fairly heavy clays here. Uh, here we've got uh, clays, yes, high, high percentage of clays, but with uh, quite a bit of cobbles. And so the, uh, 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 the soil drainage is, is actually pretty good. We get over in this uh, area, and it's pretty well the same pattern, except for the, uh, the zone in here is uh, uh, generally uh, um, lacustrine with, with uh, glacial till over lacustrine, but not with as many uh, cobbles. And so the, uh, uh, the, the soils are uh, generally fairly high in, uh, in water content and uh, poorly drained. So we have six uh, Cabernet Franc, six Riesling, um, several different appellations. As uh, mentioned, uh, the soil textures vary considerably. Um, and materials and methods, you probably can't read that unless you've got your binoculars, but that's all right. Uh, essentially what we did was we went in, we uh, uh, GPS the uh, uh, outside of, of every vineyard block and then uh, geolocated uh, roughly about 80 to 85 uh, vines and each one in, in, a, in a grid intersection uh, pattern. We did uh, TDR three times during the season at uh, fruit set, at, at lag phase, and at veraison. We did the same thing for, uh, for leaf water potential. And that's midday leaf water potential, mainly because of uh, the need for throughput. We need to get th these data and get them fairly quickly with a small crew. 
Uh, we also did uh, stomatal conductance with, uh, with a perometer, um, ran through with Green Seeker three times a year. We did our flight uh, once. Uh, this was about 5% for raisin for, uh, for Riesling. It was still lag phase for Cabernet Franc. Uh, as mentioned, about 90 meters. We had uh, three sensors. We had a RGB, we had uh, a near infrared, and, and also had a thermal sensor. And uh, tried to do that uh, midday around solar noon or, or an hour or two either side of solar noon to avoid any shadowing, make sure it was also on a, a clear day. Um, and then after that, quite a bit after that, harvest, and, and then uh, all our uh, uh, lab analysis, including uh, terpenes for the, the Riesling and also anthocyanins, phenolics for, for the, the Cabernet Franc, and then uh, PCA and regular analysis, and, and then mapping. Um, so in addition to the regular stats like uh, correlations and regressions and PCAs, uh, we also have done some PCA. We're, we're also in the process of, of doing Moran's eye just to look at uh, some of the, the spatial analysis of these maps. Okay, uh, the bulk of this talk are, are gonna, is going to be in these six PCAs. The red zone, I'll call it, uh, includes the, uh, the UAV data and any other variables that are, are very closely correlated with UAV. And in the case of this first vineyard, which is a, a lakeshore vineyard, uh, we're seeing things such as uh, uh, leaf water potential, vine size, uh, soil moisture, and things like that. Probably things that uh, don't surprise you. Um, in, in terms of inverse correlations, uh, w what we were quite happy about is we're getting some inverse correlations between um, that and uh, both free and bound terpenes in the Riesling. Um, not necessarily in the red for, uh, for anthocyanins, but uh, 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 LT50 and, um, and thermal and, and a few other things. Now this next vineyard, this is a little bit further back from the lake, heavier clay, it's uh, VSP trained. And we look at the, the red zone here, so uh, here's UAV. And uh, naturally we're going to get some effect, uh, uh, relationships between that and green seeker and yield components and to a lesser extent soil moisture and down here some, uh, uh, some berry composition. Um, over here, similar with, with Cabernet Franc, Green Seeker, berry weight, um, vine size, soil moisture, and down here, yeah, uh, anthocyanins in color and phenols. Okay, the third of six. Um, this one is Shadow de Charme. Unfortunately, they picked both blocks on us. Um, but, but nonetheless, we are seeing uh, some, some relationships here that we were hoping to see, especially vine size and, and green seeker with our UAV data um, and an inverse relationship with uh, uh, LT50. And that's worth mentioning here because we saw a lot of inverse relationships with LT50. And we didn't expect to see that. The, the dogma, if you uh, look at uh, people like Shawless and, and uh, uh, Stan Howell, you, they, they say a small vine is going to give you a hardier vine. But you have to also question, why is it a small vine? Is it a small vine because it's overcropped? Is it a small vine because it's undernourished? Uh, because it happens to be under water stress? And I think that was the case here. And that's why we were probably seeing, in many cases, um, this, this inverse correlation, shall we say, between um, LT50, which is a negative number, and so a lower negative number is actually a better number uh, ver versus uh, the UAV data. And very similar here with our Cabernet Franc. Uh, here's our LT50 here, and um, things like vine size and, and everything else is up here. Um, okay, now we're going to go over to, uh, to George. 
but I see I'm at 15 minutes already, so talk fast. Um, shall we say just uh, a lot of the same kind of relationships here and here, uh, including some um, inverse with, with anthocyanins and here with Riesling with uh, uh, terpenes. And much the same in, in this vineyard. and much the same here. So, okay, um, looking at this ba basically, uh, putting all these PCAs together, um, what are we seeing that uh, seem to associate uh, uh, with uh, UAV? Certainly Green Seeker, as we hoped, uh, but also things such as, as vine size and uh, leaf water potential and, and uh, stomatal conductance with some inverse correlations that were associated with uh, berry composition, particularly secondary metabolites like uh, anthocyanins, phenolics, um, terpenes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that, that I've more or less just said to you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'll quickly go through these maps and, and basically uh, one or two maps kind of tells you the whole thing. These high NDVI zones uh, shown by UAVs are giving us high NDVI zones that uh, the Green Seeker gave us, uh, and, and then also relatively high uh, leaf water potential, uh, 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 pruning weight, uh, berry weight, and, and TA. Okay, I'll skip over the next one um, in the interest of time and, and more or less finish off with this. I, I, last year at, at uh, JESCO uh, showed a, a version of this slide and uh, it was a bit whimsical. Um, basically what I'm showing here is uh, some Green Seeker data from a vineyard that happens to have uh, fairly severe uh, grapevine leaf roll. And um, it's Cabernet Franc. There was no actual symptoms of grapevine leaf roll in the vineyard here at the end of July. We ran through with uh, Green Seeker and we certainly found the beginnings of um, symptoms developing at the, the south end of this vineyard, uh, or north end of this vineyard, excuse me. Um, despite the fact that we couldn't see it with our naked eye, um, it started to increase um, by early September and then um, by the time you get into the end of September the comment I made last year was that even Ray Charles would know there was a, a grapevine leaf roll in that vineyard so uh, our uh, hope is to develop a unique uh, spectral signature uh, that we can associate with uh, grapevine leaf roll and possibly with uh, a, a, a red blotch uh, particularly for asymptomatic varieties. Um, and so we're uh, in the process of collecting these data now. So as far as conclusions, basically the, the PCA did show us a lot of uh, both direct and indirect conclusions, um, mostly direct conclusions with respect to yield components, vine size, uh, water status, and also some inverse correlations with respect to uh, uh, berry composition, in, in particularly uh, terpenes for, for Riesling and uh, uh, phenolic analytes for, uh, uh, for Cabernet Franc. So we've got two more years of this uh, project, and so we'll uh, update you in a couple of years, I guess. So thank you very much.